Radio Cairo, FM 95.4. The Voice of Egypt. It's exactly four, three minutes past four in Radio Cairo. This is World of Info. Coming live from Studio 3, my name is Dr. Amr Mabrouk, Dr. Mohammed is at the controls. Our direct line number is 257-89407. And today we have a great honor and great pleasure to have with us His Excellency Ambassador Antonio Patriota, the Ambassador of Brazil in Cairo. And it's really a great honor to have him with us. Uh, His Excellency has one of the brightest careers in any foreign service. He served as ambassador of his country in Washington, D.C., as the permanent representative of Brazil in the United Nations, the ambassador in Rome, now currently the ambassador of Egypt. Before that, he was also the minister of foreign affairs from the period of from 2011 to 2013. Great experienced gentleman, and uh, no wonder he studied in his early years philosophy with a diploma in foreign uh, service. So I think we are very honored and very uh, really having a great honor and pleasure to have with us a distinguished diplomat, a Renaissance man, Ambassador Antonio Patriota. Sir, thank you very much for having the time to come to our radio. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure. It's a great honor to talk about Brazil, a very friendly country to Egypt, a country that has always had uh, strong relations to Egypt. Egyptians have uh, a stigma about uh, Brazil, about uh, football, about uh, the uh, the, the, the coffee and about a lot of things, but this is not just Brazil, because mm. Brazil is one of the largest countries in the world. It's the, uh, the largest country by far in South America and Latin America, with 8.5 million square kilometers and over 211 million people. Brazil is the world's fifth largest country by area and the sixth most populous. Its capital is Brasilia, and its most populous city is Sao Paulo. It's bounded by the Atlantic Ocean on the east. Brazil has a coastline of 7,491 kilometers. It borders all other countries in South America except for Ecuador and Chile and covers 47% of the continent's land. So this puts a big burden on Brazilians and on a a country that big. And some people would say, would claim, for example, that uh, the United States is the gift of its geography. And... uh, uh, the, the Russia is a victim of geography. Egypt is a victim of geography for its for its position, and everyone wants a piece of of the cake. So Brazil is it a gift of geography, or is a, a geography was not that kind to it? No, I think geography is very important to Brazil. Perhaps geography is to Brazil what history is to Egypt. Mm-hmm. Egypt has seven thousand years of recorded history, or even more. Brazil comparatively has. Um, a short period of recorded history, 500 years, Mm -hmm. but is a very vast territory, as you have said. And uh, we border on 10 countries, and all our borders have been established through diplomacy, Mm -hmm. which is something we're very proud of. Mm -hmm. We have no territorial claims, Mm -hmm. neither do any of our 10 neighbors. So this establishes South America as a region of a certain cultural and uh, linguistic homogeneity, although we are the only Portuguese speaking, Mm. all uh, our neighbors, with the exception of the three Guyanas that Mm. are smaller countries speaking English, Dutch, and French. Otherwise, they speak Spanish, and Mm. Spanish and Portuguese are are similar languages. Mm. It's easy to communicate. But um, Brazil, of course, uh, within this vast territory, uh, uh, has very different landscapes and um, areas. We have the largest rainforest in the world, as you know, in the mm-hmm. Amazon region. Mm-hmm. We are the most biodiverse country uh, in the world. And uh, we have a, I think, very privileged coastline mm-hmm. because um, you mentioned uh, the 7,000 and a half mm-hmm. kilometers of coastline. And all of that coast is in comparatively warm waters. Mm-hmm. Uh, so. It's a very attractive country to visit, and we hope that more and more Egyptians Mm. come and see Brazil to experience the the culture, the landscapes, and the friendly Brazilian people, as you mentioned. Definitely friendly Brazilian people who have a multi-ethnicity. And uh, uh, before we went on air, you were saying, sir, that 11 million of Brazilians 
have Arab descendancy, mainly, of course, Lebanese, with the famous uh, uh, wave of uh, immigration that happened in the late 19th century, early 20th century. But this also put a very important impact on uh, as being multicultural, multi-ethnicity. We have, uh, when the Portuguese came first to, 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 to Brazil in the year 1500, 1495 and 1500, and started to take up the region of Brazil to be part of the Portuguese empire, yet more people started coming. They are not just uh, white people. They were a lot of, of course, unfortunately, a lot of Africans were, were taken up as slaves, mm -hmm. uh, reaching almost 2.5 million who were uh, forced uh, slavery at that time. But things changed. Nowadays, we can say that 48% of the Brazilians claim that they are white, 43% are claiming that they are brown, mm -hmm. and others uh, go into 8% claiming that they are having some black color or so. And then the ethnicity decrease whether they are calling themselves yellow, it's less than 2%, and uh, people are not uh, qualifying themselves as any of these uh, strange ethnicity. So this multi-bowl of, uh, of races has really definitely uh, changed and uh, uh, shaped the country of today. Yes, absolutely, it has. Um, I think Brazil can be considered a true melting pot mm. because in Brazil, um, the people from different backgrounds, religious, uh, geographic, ethnic, they, they all um, mix together into one uh, single culture. We have a certain degree of homogeneity and diversity mm. in the same country. Mm. We have a single official language, as you know, um, we all speak Portuguese from north, south, east, west, and there are different accents, but it's essentially one language with, of course, uh, several indigenous groups that still have their own mm -hmm. languages. Mm -hmm. um, but these are now mm, close to 1 million out of 210 million, as you, as you mentioned. So we're very proud of this um, mixed heritage, uh, European, African, uh, indigenous, and we... Um, we have also the largest population of Arab descent mm -hmm. outside the Arab mm -hmm. world, as mm -hmm. you mentioned, mostly Syrian Lebanese who have been there for more than a hundred years, but also the largest community of Japanese descent mm -hmm. outside Japan, uh, close to two million Brazilians, mm -hmm. the largest community of Italian descent, mm -hmm. for, for example, outside Italy. This is something that is not that well known. You have some Italian descendancy, sir? In my case, no, uh, <laughs> even though my last name, uh, Patriota, <laughs> is exactly, means the same in Italian or Spanish, yes. or is an easily translatable name, and it's mm. a fully Brazilian name. It was mm. created by a great, great, great grandfather uh, in the 19th century who mm. came to Brazil. So um, this is one of the most important defining aspects of mm. our identity, and Many people say that, oh, Brazil is colorblind and racist blind. We, we don't distinguish between races and color and, and religion. This is not entirely true. Yes. I think more and more people are aware of subtle forms of discrimination and lingering inequality that needs to be tackled. And I think we need to be very vigilant as a society mm -hmm. in order to offer equal opportunity to all Brazilians. I think these things has changed. I mean, in the 19th century, definitely there was racism. There was, of course, the especially in the even in the 18th century, the 17th century, with the gush of the slavery trade. This was very well organized. But I think as time goes, and nowadays in the 21st century, we can claim that it is mostly colorblind. Well, it it is uh, on road to become mm -hmm. this way, but there are still um, aspects that I think uh, require. Um, special attention. Mm -hmm. For example, in the diplomatic career, mm -hmm. there are very few people of African descent. Mm -hmm. uh, so we need to create incentives mm -hmm. uh, for more women, for a, a wider uh, representation of society to be included in, mm -hmm. in some professions. Mm -hmm. But differently, for example, from what happened in the United States, which is another country that had slavery mm -hmm. for several centuries, once slavery was abolished in Brazil, there were never any discriminatory mm. laws that institutionalized uh, discrimination. Mm. Whereas in the American South, as the, you know, until the 1960s, there were. So this is a, a special characteristic. And I think um, I can speak um, confidently to say that 
even for those Brazilians who identify as a white or mm. European descent, we're very proud of our African heritage. Mm. And uh, when we celebrate our music, for example, our music would be inconceivable without the African influence. It's mm. what gives it the flavor, the, the spice, the rhythm. So um, for all of us, um, Africa is a very important part of who and, we are. And I like the fact that uh, some, almost 43% of, of Brazilians are classifying themselves uh, themselves ethnically as being brown. And when you say the yeah. word brown, this is definitely the product of mixed marriages. Absolutely. And this is yeah. different than, uh, I mean, to see a mixed marriage in the United States in the 50s and the 60s or the early 60s, this was almost uh, very rare. I mean, in the 70s and 80s, yes. of course, and, and, and the states of today, this is there, something else. Yes. So in, in Brazil, 43% to be coming from mixed marriages. This means that uh, not long ago, uh, the, yeah. the, the society is becoming the, more the or numbers, less colorblind. The numbers are more than half uh, of the Brazilian population identifies as brown mm -hmm. or black uh, or mixed. Yes. And interestingly, also in, the, in Brazil, uh, the way you identify yourself um, mm -hmm you're entirely free to identify yourself as you wish. Mm -hmm. For example, if your father is of European descent and your mother is of African descent and you wish to identify as white, you mm -hmm. can. Mm -hmm. uh, it's up to you, it's voluntary. Yes. There's no kind of um, biological pseudo rule mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. that, that determines uh, how you should identify yourself. So it's an interesting feature of our society that um, more than half of the population is happy and mm. voluntarily identifies as non-white. Exactly. Yeah. And, and we go to, to another important point, which is the metamorphosis in its history. It, Brazil has changed from a colony of, of Portugal to, to the year 1805 to an empire and to a republic. And, uh, and of course, as a kingdom for a short period of time, which is very interesting. And then there is an authoritarian military junta. When we speak especially, I think, the best period that we could say the formation years are the year 1805 because it has seen the the approach of the Napoleon Bonaparte to the main uh, Portugal at that time and mainland and the fact that they wanted the king himself or the queen at that time decided to 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 go abroad and to go to Brazil to save the the throne and to 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 protect the the throne and to make an empire so the change from from of the mainland to Brazil and then to have an own kingdom by the by the heir to the throne Pedro the first and then Pedro the second this puts us on sort of is this the real start of the f the national feeling that we are no longer a colony but we are Brazilians but in and out of ourselves well this is the decidedly identity. an important historical landmark mm -hmm. And sometimes I mention to my Egyptian friends that Napoleon has had a strong influence mm. in both our histories yes. huh? because yes, he has exactly. a very important history influence in Egyptian mm. history, mm. awakening a national sentiment. Yes. And in the case of Brazil, um, it was due to the Napoleonic threat mm. against Portugal that the uh, royal family moved from Lisbon to Rio. Mm. Rio, my hometown, mm. Rio yes. de Janeiro, is the only city in the Americas that was the capital of a European country exactly. for a certain number of years. Mm -hmm. So, And we were the only country in the Americas to be a monarchy mm -hmm. for more than half a century. Mm -hmm. um, so not only do we speak a very unique language in the region, but we also have a history that distinguishes us mm -hmm. uh, from, our from our neighbors. Of course, we became a republic uh, towards the end of the 19th century. Mm -hmm. But you are correct in pointing out that the monarchy uh, had an important role. It um, helped to unify this very large territory, you know, in an age when there was no internet, mm -hmm. no telephone, um, communications were, were very difficult. Um, but the common language established itself from uh, through, throughout the territory, and the symbolism of the monarchy uh, was a strong one mm -hmm. that um, created a sense of national identity. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the second king, Emperor Peter II, mm. uh, had a keen interest in Egypt. Mm. He, he studied Arabic and many other languages, and he came twice to Egypt during his reign. Uh, the first time, exactly 150 years ago, mm. uh, with, a long, um, with a large retinue, including his wife, the members of, of his staff. And the second time, he spent more than 40 days going up the Nile, mm -hmm. 
uh, even as far south as modern day Sudan mm -hmm. and taking photographs. At the time, photography was what today artificial intelligence would be. Mm -hmm. But he traveled with photographers and, and many of these photographs have been showcased here in Cairo mm -hmm. at an exhibit and they will be showcased again in December at the Biblioteca in Alexandria. Alexandria. Yes. Well, Pedro II is really a very interesting gentleman. I mean, his father, when he was forced to go back to, to Portugal because uh, everybody was saying, how come uh, an empire, its capital is in the... Uh, is in a colony and therefore the capital has go, has to go to back and the court has to go back to uh, to Portugal and to Lisbon and he wa was forced to go back in 1831 and leave on the throne his young child who was five years old. Mm -hmm. So Pedro II as a five year uh, old kid or a boy uh, was forced to go to the throne at the age of 15 and yet a character like this, everybody thought that he would not be a Renaissance man. Everybody mm -hmm. thought that he would be a spoiled kid or, uh, or a, a, a dummy on the throne. Mm -hmm. Yet he proved of a great important uh, factor in the stability of the country mm -hmm. and initiation uh, such of a, st a strong uh, cultural heritage. Yet in 1888, he was forced to, to leave the throne. I mean, uh, and a lot of people at that time were against this move. Why do you expect that? Is, is, was the military behind it or what? As they came. Well, the military did play a role, but um, there are many interesting studies about uh, Peter II, and I think you are correct to point out uh, his strong personality, his um, intellectual curiosity. Mm -hmm. You know, this is a man who, in the 19th century, um, studied not only European languages mm -hmm. that you would expect him to, his mother being from the Austrian royal mm -hmm. family, so he spoke. English, German. French, and yeah. Italian, and German, but he also uh, had a, a very good knowledge of Arabic, mm -hmm. and Hebrew, and even Sanskrit, mm -hmm. which for the time was, even today, I think would be rather mm -hmm. exotic. Uh, so uh, this man of great curiosity who believed in the education of the Brazilian people, and in fact, the education of women also, mm -hmm. uh, his daughters were highly educated. Mm -hmm. um, he was... Um, indirectly someone who contributed to the abolition of, of uh, slavery um, mm. although he was supported by slave owners uh, mm. who supported the monarchy uh, he did own slaves himself and he commemorated one of the important laws that led to the complete abolition when he was in Alexandria here mm. in Egypt mm -hmm. this is an in interesting historic fact this was in what 1860 something right? it was yes 1870 70, yes. 1870 yes. the first time um, you know, um, this mo Einstein. Yeah, modern day historians um, are of the opinion that um, in some respects he was not a monarchist himself mm. because he could see that the monarchy had fulfilled a certain role mm. in consolidating Brazilian identity and its territorial integrity. But we were surrounded by republics mm. in the Americas and that, um, you know, uh, for the future, uh, Brazil should become better integrated mm -hmm. in the region and uh, with a more similar form of government. So uh, I think modern day historians consider that he didn't make any attempt to prevent uh, the end of the monarchy. Yes. Uh, and, and I believe that this is the case. Uh, so when he left and the Republic was announced, he didn't feel betrayed in mm -hmm. any way. He felt that this was a natural course of events. For the royal the family left, sir, Brazil, or they, or they um, stayed in His Brazil. daughters stayed behind. She would, be, would have been the heir to the throne. And mm -hmm. even now there are descendants uh, mm -hmm. from the royal family. And there's an interesting curiosity is that one of the descendants married an Egyptian at okay. some point. So mm -hmm. one of the so-called princes from the Bragança family mm -hmm. has some Egyptian ancestry. Mm. And he is very fond of Egypt. He is a photographer who was exposed here in Cairo. Mm. Um, but he went to France he, um, and to Portugal, and he died in Paris. Uh, he was a very popular man in exile uh, mm. during his last two years. And when, he was, um, uh, when there was a wake for him at the Église de la Madeleine in Paris, mm. It is said that thousands and thousands of people came to visit uh, his coffin. He had become friends with the scientists of his time, like Pasteur and, and the intellectuals like Victor Hugo. This is the gentleman who married an Egyptian? No, no. This is King uh, Pedro II. Oh, uh, yeah, you yeah, mean yeah. you're talking yeah. about the king himself? The yes. king himself, when he went to Paris yes. after the Republic was proclaimed and he 
lived for two more years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So he died in 1890 or something like that? He died in the early 1890s, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this is very interesting because the life and times of royals have been always uh, under examination with a lot of curiosities, as we mm -hmm. use the expression. So always people would like to see what happened next, what happened yeah. after that. Yeah, yeah. So when you find that the family was not uh, confiscated and mm -hmm. a lot of them are still living mm -hmm. in Brazil with a lot of descendants still living, they're doing business or something like that and they're living in, in Brazil, right? So yeah, they've gone into all areas. There are some who are in politics. Uh, there's this famous photographer. Mm -hmm. So yes, they are active. But, you know, we've come a long way since those days and uh, we've gone through different um, mm -hmm. ups and downs like mm -hmm. many countries. Today, we are the second largest democracy in the Americas mm -hmm. and one of the largest in the world. And this year, we will be having elections on October 3rd. So, so just uh, as we are passing through history rapidly, because we have taken a lot of time mm -hmm. in our history, but it's very rich and very interesting history. If we talk about the period from 1888 and... Uh, the abolition of abolition of the of the kingdom and the royals there was a period of a republic mm -hmm. but mostly it was under the control of the army and we have seen a very interesting character coming up he's a civilian but he was under the control of the of of, uh, of the military faragas and he stayed on and off mm -hmm. in power mm -hmm. and in the end in 1954 uh, he disappeared mysteriously by committing suicide mm -hmm. so this period from 1930 to 1954 and this period of turmoil at the time of the fascism that was in, mm -hmm. in, in europe at that period of time and the fact that brazil has chosen to be uh, on the neutral side until 1942 and then engaged as the only Latin American country That's that correct. engaged in the war on the mm -hmm. side of of the Allies even mm -hmm. with an expeditionary force in in, in Italy mm -hmm. in, the, in the mountains of Italy so when you talk about this period mm -hmm. at, at, uh, in Portugal the the mother nation of Emmaus there was Salazar and he was mm -hmm. in control of the situation was Faragas another Salazar or he was somebody else uh, no, I would say that Vargas was quite different uh, from, Salava, from Salazar because Vargas, um, of course, remains to some degree a controversial mm. uh, figure, but he was a modernizer. Mm. Uh, he was extremely nationalistic and uh, he believed in the industrialization mm. of Brazil, for mm. example. Yes. So, so um, in exchange for Brazilian participation in World War II, you are correct to point out we were the mm. only Latin American mm. country to send troops. and. Um, many of them perished uh, mm -hmm. in Italy. Uh, there's a very um, important cemetery near Pistoia mm -hmm. that... that uh, you visited pays, yourself, I visited, of course, yes. as the ambassador, right? As ambassador in Rome, I would go every year. Mm -hmm. uh, to lay some to, flowers, to, to, and exactly, flowers yeah. yes. And it's a, something that is remembered by the Italians, you know, mm -hmm. with, with great uh, warmth and, and friendship. Um, but in exchange, you know, he, he, um, he asked for... Uh, international assistance to mm. build um, a um, iron uh, sorry railways mm. and um, uh, uh, steelworks mm -hmm. yes. steelworks this is the word that, that was um, steelworks in southern Brazil and other modernizing industries uh, he also established some important uh, labor laws mm. uh, that have uh, remained uh, for, for many decades. So, um, although controversial, because he did have a period when he um, amassed uh, extraordinary powers mm -hmm. you know, as, a, yes. as a leader, um, let's say with dictatorial um, powers. aspects, mm -hmm. he was ultimately elected also democratically. Mm -hmm. And his last government was a very, considered by most people as a one where Brazil made much progress mm -hmm. uh, economically, socially, etc. So, an interesting personality yes. with, with more complex, very complex personality. I think that the yeah. historians love him because they, they have a lot of material to write yes. about him. And I think the last, word, yeah, the last word has not been written about him. Exactly. This is what, what, what yeah. attracted my attention. Yeah. So leaving history and talking very smoothly about the last period of the, of the uh, military junta from 1964 to 85, things are getting more towards democratization. Of course. And, and there was a start of a democratic movement. And uh, so this, how far is democracy now established in Brazil today? You're saying, sir, that this year, hopefully by the end of the year, we'll have uh, another elections of a new president. And things have changed gradually and smoothly from 1985 onwards. There have been some pitfalls. There have been uh, presidents that have been impeached. 
a president has been impeached, and presidents who have fallen from grace, and presidents who remain in the memory of mm. of, uh, of Brazilians. But most of these presidents came through elections. So, oh, absolutely. So and, and this yeah. makes them very special, right? Yes, and, and impeachment in itself uh, is not undemocratic because it's foreseen in, in the Constitution. Mm. And the, the process of impeachment in, in the two cases that it happened mm. um, was, let's say, very transparent mm. and uh, there, there were no um, acts of violence or brutality or anything of that mm. nature. Mm. So I would say that Brazil um, is a consolidated democracy. Of course, all democracies are imperfect of course. and uh, it's a process and uh, a learning curve. We, try to learn from experience and um, uh, enhance the positives and, and, and try to do uh, our best so that the negatives don't repeat themselves. Uh, as you mentioned, we have elections this year on October 3rd. So elections will be for president, vice president, uh, governors mm -hmm. of the 27 Six. federal units, um, senators, one third of the Senate. Uh, there are 81 senators uh, in Brazil. Mm -hmm. And uh, all the congressmen, we have two houses in our Congress, a uh, Chamber of Deputies and a Senate, so 513 congressmen. Mm -hmm. um, Brazil uh, has a very fragmented political system yes. with uh, 23 parties, so it's a little bit more complicated than, say, a country like the United States, where you know you have Republicans and de Democrats. That's it, yes. <laughs> and um, there was a, a famous Brazilian composer, uh, mm. Antonio Carlos Robin, who wrote the famous Girl from Ipanema, who used to say, Brazil is not for beginners, because some, <laughs> of, some of these uh, you know, political um, specificities of Brazil are quite complex. But uh, very democratic, with a very free press, um, no political prisoners. Um, these are all conquests that have come through struggle, because mm. as you pointed out, uh, there were two decades and a half of uh, military dictatorship mm -hmm. from 64 onwards. Yes. So when we talk about Brazil today, we, we find a great, uh, great accomplishment of the Brazilian people because it is a uh, regional and middle power and is also classified as an emerging power. It is considered as advanced emerging economy, having the 12th largest GDP in the world by no, uh, nominal and the 8th by uh, the PPP measures, the largest in Latin America as an upper middle income uh, economy by the World Bank and of newly industrial country, industrialized countries. And also it's a donor of aid for other countries of $1 billion every, uh, every year uh, of donation to, to thriving or uh, to emerging economies helping them as well. So mm -hmm. it's a donor country. It's a country that uh, although has borrowed from the IMF, has returned the money that it has borrowed from the, uh, from the bank even before the time of, uh, of, the, of, the, uh, of the debt to, to rise. So acting as a superpower, we find that this, uh, an emerging uh, economic power, we would like to know the secret for our listeners. How come, I, of course, the country has beautiful geography and everything. How come the country was able to, to build this rising economy? Through what? Well, I don't think there's a secret or a recipe that can mm. be replicated. You know, each uh, mm. country has its own characteristics, its strengths, its challenges. It's true that Brazil is in a comparatively peaceful neighborhood, mm -hmm. so we don't have some of the challenges that a country like Egypt needs to face yes. in terms of security. And in theory, that should give you, let's say, more space for concentrating your efforts on development. But we are still a very unequal country, although we are among, let's say, the, the 10 or sometimes 15 largest economies, depends sometimes on the exchange rate. Yes. Uh, we've been mm. the seventh largest economy. I think nowadays we would be considered the 12th. Um, but um, the inequality is a big challenge. Mm. You know, Latin American countries are very unequal. So uh, this is something that uh, will need to be tackled for the future. Um, we have been successful in uh, tapping into the great agricultural mm -hmm. potential of the mm -hmm. country. Um, not all of the land that is planted today in Brazil mm -hmm. used to be considered fit for mm -hmm. agriculture. So this is the result of um, um, technology research. We have perhaps the most advanced uh, tropical agriculture research center in yes. the world, yes. in, in Brazil, that has uh, helped uh, the country to uh, 
claim areas. That, and this is not the Amazon, by the way, because the Amazon is a different it's region. Different, but, yeah. but in central Brazil, areas that were considered, uh, let's say, too dry or without sufficient water resources. Uh, of course, we have an abundance of water. This is also something in contrast mm -hmm. with the Middle East and Egypt in particular, which is helpful. Um, but I think um, what countries really need, if you ask my opinion, to um, uh, advance and progress economically, socially, is to invest a lot in its youth and mm -hmm. in education. Yes. Um, to the extent that um, you are creating qualified people mm -hmm. um, to enter into different aspects of uh, government, uh, private sector, academia, etc. Uh, this is the best possible investment for a more possible prosperous and a better future for Sao all. Paulo University is considered to be one of the eminent universities and uh, although it's a public university it's, had, it's great in one of the best universities in, in Latin America and as you said you mentioned about the education we also would like to emphasize the role of industry and the infrastructure because you have invested much in the infrastructure building a lot of roads especially in the late 70s onwards that have even mm -hmm. uh, superseded the, the, the building in the railway. You, have not, you didn't invest much in the railway, it's even decreased oh. from 31,000 to 30,000 mm -hmm. uh, railway miles, but now you're invested more in the roads. Mm -hmm. So this investment in the infrastructure really has helped the progress that we have seen now? Yes, um, there was a very strong drive towards uh, infrastructure mm -hmm. development, um, starting actually with Getulio Vargas, whom you mentioned, mm -hmm. and then in the 60s. Um, Juscelino Kubitschek was mm. uh, the president who created our new capital. Mm. This yes, is another Brazil, point in yes, common yes. with Egypt, where mm. we, we created a new capital mm. from scratch, mm. uh, was very uh, instrumental in, um, in helping the territory to integrate better, mm. you know, because most of the population historically had been concentrated along the sea coast. Mm. So this vast hinterland or interior needed to be populated. And, and Bra Brasilia, I think, has can be considered a success, you know. Mm. I, we diplomats, when we go back to Brazil, of course, we live in Brasilia, and um, I follow Brasilia for the past four decades. It used to be a small town with very few resources. Now it's become rather cosmopolitan with mm. 140 embassies. Mm. Uh, so um, this kind of infrastructure and, and um, investment in um, New cities, the roads, etc., which I see also in Egypt, mm. I think has been helpful in our case. Unfortunately, I think we have to recognize that some of the infrastructure uh, would need um, to be revamped. Yes, yeah, to be revisited. I think um, mm. we've become um, an important exporter, for example, of not only agricultural products but also many manufactured products. And our seaports, um, they are they are working twenty four hours uh, a day, ports, seven. Which makes them very yes. Important. So they you know they they need to be modernized, and I think this will be a challenge for future governments. But essentially, I think it's a good investment uh, for a large country like this. And I see here in Egypt also the same kind of mm -hmm. concern with infrastructure. I've been traveling through your excellent roads. Um, I was at the White Desert last week. Yes, I liked it. <laughs> yes, I enjoyed it very much. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about, for example, the roads also you're having, uh, Brazil is the second to, to the United States in having the largest number of airfields and airports. And uh, beside that, your uh, Air Emperor, if I may use the, the, if I'm pronouncing it properly, that's the air industry or aeronautic industries that is in Brazil. It is the third largest industrial. Embraer. Embraer, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sorry, I always knew that I would not be able to pronounce it. So even Egypt Air has, has bought some of your planes. Yes, So uh, So these, these planes uh, are her definitely, they are one of the great exports, mm -hmm. industrial exports of, of Brazil. And at the same time, they help very much in the communication in between Absolutely. remote areas, right? Because yeah. of the airfields, right? Absolutely. The distances are great in Brazil, mm. you know, mm. as you can gather from just so you, looking at So your investment in that was important, right? Very important, um, because um, nowadays, um, if you have some business in the north or in the Ma Amazon, and then you have to be back in Sao Paulo, which is the heart of the economic uh, activity in Brazil, or Rio, which remains also an important mm. center, and maybe the cultural capital, or Brasilia. Uh, you can't afford to uh, drive a car or take a bus. Uh, the airplane mm. is fundamental. Mm. So indeed, there are many airfields. There is a um, 
a well-established um, aircraft industry, mm -hmm. um, very competitive in mid-size airplanes, Crazy. and and we have sold to the entire world, in mm -hmm. fact, and and here in the Middle East as well. There's an office of Embraer in, mm -hmm. in Dubai. <laughs> yes. uh, the representative is often in Egypt. We have sold airplanes to Egypt. Egypt has also bought some military aircraft mm -hmm. from Brazil, the mm -hmm. Super Tucanos, mm -hmm. uh, in the past. So this is one area of excellence in the industrial field. And cars as well, motor vehicles. Yes, um, our car industry um, is very well established. Was well. established in the late 50s, mm. uh, in the post Second World War, with quite a bit of foreign investment from Germany. Volkswagen mm. yes. is is a traditional um, industrial. And it went automobile. on producing Beetle for as long as it could be. I think we were the last country in the <laughs> to world stop to, the beetle to stop producing Beetles, but um, many other uh, companies uh, from Sweden, Italy, uh, Fiat mm -hmm. is very big in mm -hmm. Brazil. During the economic crisis around 2008, 9, 10, um, Brazilian Fiat was the most productive Fiat company in the world because mm -hmm. Italy went into recession. Mm -hmm. So um, Ford and other companies have been present as well. Uh, yes, this has been a, um, a drive for industrialization and modernization of the economy um, and also the creation of a um, working class mm -hmm. that um, produced one of our leaders, who was a trade union yes. leader, President Lula, who was yes. the last president of Brazil to visit Egypt. As and you... and he, was, he is definitely very popular and I think he's, a content, he's contending in this uh, next elections with the highest polls, right? More That's less. correct, mm -hmm. yes. Differently from the United States and Brazil, well, um, the constitution allows for two successive mandates mm -hmm. of four years. But then if the uh, head of state and government steps down for one or more mandates, he can present himself again. Mm -hmm. uh, this is not allowed in the U.S. Uh, system. Yes. So, so indeed, President Lula, uh, who has been cleared now through the uh, justice system, will be, I think, um, a strong contender because he so, is polling ahead of the, yes. the current president, President Bolsonaro. The Americans did it only once with Franklin Delano Roosevelt, of course, FDR. That's correct. But uh, for four terms. But they changed the constitution they after. The yeah. Yeah. His fourth president. You're was. a very good historian. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm just curious. Yeah. <laughs> so, before we leave uh, to the very important subject of the Egyptian-Brazilian uh, relations, we have to talk about two important points. Definitely, uh, the health challenges in Brazil during the COVID time were extremely. Uh, bad times, mm -hmm. and it, it has put a lot of eff uh, a lot of load on the health uh, system, mm -hmm. and uh, Brazil has faced a lot of troubles, uh, especially before the vaccination. So, how Brazil uh, acted with this, and how Brazil is planning to act in the further attacks of COVID? Unfortunately, we are having every few months a new uh, uh, a new virus coming back on the block. As many as Yes, no, you're correct to point out that uh, Brazil was one of the countries hardest hit uh, by the first waves of the COVID pandemic. And um, it was a curious phenomenon to see that um, uh, level of development didn't necessarily um, prevent a country from being very hard hit yes. because the United States uh, was, was also very hard hit yes. and then Brazil and the <coughs> Americas was the second. So during that phase, it was a very um, difficult period uh, for us. But um, there is a silver lining to this, and it's the fact that vaccination has proceeded at ver at very accelerated pace. Very good. Now, this is thanks uh, in part to our universal health care mm. system mm. Uh, that covers the entire population. Mm. And, and Brazilians uh, are much less hesitant than some other mm, people. Mm. Uh, in being vaccinated. In obeying the, uh, yes, they, the they, they believe very much in vaccines. Um, their um, children are vaccinated against a number mm. of other diseases. Uh, and so this has proceeded very well, and it has stemmed uh, the impact of, mm. let's say, the variants that came. Mm. Uh, it's a number of deaths, let's mm. say, in contagion, maybe not as much as we would like, but uh, certainly the, the, the death toll has been much, much mm much smaller. So I'm, I'm relatively confident that this will continue to be the pattern for the for the coming mm. months and years. Last before last before least, of course, is tourism. Uh, I found out that most of the tourism, in spite, in spite of the fact that before the COVID, you were having about 6.5 million visitors from abroad. 
And I think that this is a very humble number for the 7,000 yeah. <laughs> miles of the coastline. But I believe because most of the tourists, which are not c calculated or counted, are the inside uh, That's tourists, correct. right? Because most of the Brazilians will spend their vacation in other countries or in other uh, territories or on uh, other than their uh, inland uh, cities going to the coast and become, becoming themselves tourists of the country, right? Most that tourists. is correct, yes. Um, well, since we, um, given, given the size of the territory, mm. we have different climates, mm. as you can imagine. Yes. Uh, the south of Brazil can be very cold in winter. Mm. Um, we don't have very much snow, so there are no ski stations. Mm. Occasionally it may snow in the extreme south, but still, Many of uh, the southerners, they mm. seek warmer climates mm. during their winter, so mm. they go to the beaches of um, Rio or Bahia or the Northeast that are very... So the number is not six, six million, beautiful. definitely. Well, this is foreign frequent. tourists. Yeah. Foreign tourists yes. would be six but, million, but, but there's a lot of domestic tourism. Domestic tourism could be maybe 20 million or something, definitely. Right? I don't have the figures here, and it varies mm. uh, according to the status, uh, economic health of the country. Yes. So, you know, in periods of downturn, people travel less, mm. but people are starting to travel again. But in this respect, I think we have much to learn from Egypt mm. because um, Egypt is a touristic uh, superpower in mm. many respects. Yes. Uh, you attract at the height of your um, tourist yes, uh, 11 million in 2010. 11 yes, million, yes. or I think it reached 14 million at some mm. point. Mm -hmm. Um, you have excellent hotels and very good infrastructure and a good exactly, yes. uh, touristic culture. Um, in Brazil, um, it still is developing, and um, I think it's, it would be very desirable for us to um, invest a little bit more in our touristic um, uh, capacity because tourism is, a, is a, an activity that generates employment uh, mm -hmm. for young people and very often it raises the standard of living of the areas. Um, for example, I, I go very often to the state of Bahia, uh, mm. that is a beautiful state in northern Brazil with very attractive landscapes, beaches, and uh, culture and cuisine. Mm. Uh, um, and I can see the benefits of tourism in some of the small towns along the coast. It's uh, a heavy population industry, which makes it uh, yep. a lot of people can work in it. And exactly. therefore redu reducing the, exactly. the unemployment. And scale. it encourages yeah. young people to, you know, become professionalized and, and learn languages and uh, learn other skills that will help them in accounting or in uh, mm. other types of services. Definitely. So, yes, I think um, for the future we will... will there's great potential for tourism in Brazil mm. because of the variety of the uh, different uh, regions. There, there are historic cities with um, interesting architecture, uh, colonial Portuguese architecture. Yes. It's one of the uh, Bra Brazil is one of the largest UNESCO heritage sites. It's uh, number thirteen. Uh, it's, well, thirteen is good. Not not yeah. as advanced as but Egypt, but, uh, uh, but still it's advanced. Five hundred years of heritage. Yeah, yeah. Is, yeah, we we have we have our very interesting cities and and, and towns and and of course the nature I think is uh, exceptional in Brazil. Hmm. So. Um, no, maybe it's a it's um, something that we can we can cooperate more closely on for the, the future, especially as we anticipate the possibility of having a direct flight. Yes, we're looking forward uh, to all of that. We want to go to Cairo and Sao Paulo. This yes. will be an excellent boost. For Sao Paulo or Rio? What do you prefer? Well, I was born in Rio. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, um, uh, of course, I am very attached to my hometown and its culture, its personality. It's a very mm, open-minded city. It's a port mm. city. Uh, it was the capital of Brazil uh, mm. for a long time until recently when we moved to Brasilia. In the 60s, yes, yes. Yeah. But Sao Paulo is the um, business center, um, very cosmopolitan, a city full of energy. Uh, I also have relatives in Sao Paulo. I'm, I have relatives in many parts of Brazil. <laughs> so I'm not one of these people who tend to, you know, find that only my hometown is of any value. I, I, I love many other places in Brazil, including Sao Paulo, and I would encourage Egyptians to discover uh, the many charms of Sao Paulo. It, it has fantastic restaurants, for example, and very practically every cuisine in the world because of the mosaic and the mm. melting pot that Brazil is. So excellent Arab cuisine, mm. Syrian, Lebanese, and Japanese, Italian, of course, and and mainstream Brazilian, uh, what you like. So, 
the largest airport nowadays is in Sao Paulo, and I think Egypt Air is uh, planning to hopefully to very a direct soon. flight. Yes, from Cairo there. So stay with us tuned. This is, we're having a very beautiful talk with His Excellency, uh, Excellency Ambassador Antonio Patriota, Ambassador of Brazil in Cairo. And after the break, we'll talk about Egyptian-Brazilian relations. So there are a lot of talks that we are doing off air as more than we are going on air because definitely it's, it's a very rich talk. Dear listeners, we are proud to have with us, our, with us here today His Excellency Ambassador Antriot, Antonio Patriota. I mean, not only he is ambassador in distinguished countries in D.C., in, in the United Nations, in Rome and Egypt, but he was also the Minister of Foreign Affairs for Brazil. And so when you are uh, overexposed to all these aspects of the world, of the world then you become uh, a global personality and a global gentleman with a lot of reading and a lot of information that is coming to you and you're processing every day this, this vast wealth of information and you're using it to build the opinion of not you yourself but of the country itself and of your country definitely it's a great honor to have with us his, uh, uh, today his excellency ambassador Antoni patriot we're talking about egypt and egyptian brazilian relations because uh, i think that when the minister of the current minister of foreign affairs in in brazil decided to uh, to bring a very experienced gentleman with the, all your credentials sir uh, to represent his country in Egypt, this means a lot. This means that Brazil looks to Egypt as a, uh, as a dear friend, as an ally, and as a country that has a lot of things in common and a lot of bridges to build more. I see that you're uh, during your short tenure here, you're beginning to be very active in the field of communication and bridging, making a bridge across the Atlantic to Sao Paulo with, with Egypt Air. This is something of great importance. But there are a lot of things that Egypt can share with Brazil. Brazil is one of the biggest countries in the field of renewable energy. Uh, Brazil is having its effort in not only in the wind, but also in methanol and all these structuring. So how far is the relations going between Egypt and Brazil and the communication, which I think is on a daily basis with your presence here, sir? Well, I'm, I'm pleased to say that um, I believe that uh, we're on very solid ground. Mm -hmm. um, in two years' time, uh, 2024, we will celebrate 100 years mm -hmm. of bilateral relations and 100 years of permanent presence of a Brazilian diplomatic representative here in Cairo. And Ambassador, definitely, because 24, there was the independence of Egypt was uh, declared in 1922, so exactly. definitely 24, it was an embassy, it was not a council. Exactly, mm -hmm. so that was very quickly after your, your independence. And uh, of course, since then, uh, the relationship has diversified and, and gained a different dimension. Uh, we have a free trade agreement, for example, among the Mercosul countries that um, include, in addition to Brazil, <coughs> Argentina, Paraguay, and Uruguay. And this has been enforced since 2017. And for the past um, several years, Egypt has been uh, our number one trading partner in Africa. Um, if you look at the Arab world, sometimes the number two, number one, number three, depending on the year but very significant trade uh, between our two countries uh, at about two billion five hundred million US dollars. Mm -hmm. um, Brazil has a trade surplus with Egypt, but the good news is that Egypt is increasing its exports to Brazil at very significant rates. Um, the two economies are complementary in, in many respects because Egypt is a net food importer mm -hmm. And we are a um, significant exporter of agriculture. Soya oil and... Uh, yes. Before that, it was the sugar cane. Nowadays, not more. <laughs> not well, like coffee, that. <laughs> we're number one in Coffee producer. for the past 150 yes, years. <laughs> exactly. Uh, my family was actually in the coffee producing business. Mm, definitely. But um, so coffee, sugar, corn is now... Mm. We're now number one exporter and an important product in our trade uh, balance. Um, but also uh, soya, as you yes. mentioned, mm. yeah, very significant. And beef, beef has mm. been. Brazil's You're one of the, the, the most important countries in the production of processed food. Yes, right. And, and halal, uh, yes, halal beef <laughs> for, beef. for the Muslim world. <coughs> yes, exactly. So this is part of the the narrative and the um, exciting uh, prospects for the future. I uh, I hope to receive in the coming days uh, our Minister of Agriculture here uh, in Cairo. Mm 
who will be coming precisely to talk about one important aspect in our trade, which is our imports of fertilizer mm. uh, from Egypt. Mm. Um, Brazil, although a country with an abundance of um, fertile land and water and, and uh, dedicating much of it to agriculture, we are not self-sufficient in fertilizer. Mm -hmm. So we import from several countries in the Arab world, including Morocco, Egypt, uh, possibly in the future. Because of the phosphate industry and yes. the phosphate reserves that we have. Exactly. We have a lot of phosphate in Abu Tartur area, and I think that's why our president uh, recently is trying to revive the, uh, the Abu Tartur phosphate, um, uh, phosphate uh, exactly. mines. Yeah. Exactly. So, um, you know, with this um, war in Ukraine, between Ukraine and Russia, mm -hmm. um, um, our imports of fertilizer from those countries has uh, suffered a setback, and we need to find uh, alter alternatives. Mm. So this is the logic behind this visit, mm. but also to celebrate our ties and hopefully to establish closer cooperation between our research institute mm. that I mentioned, yes. that is very advanced on the tropical mm. front, uh, and Egyptian uh, agricultural research institutes. Mm. Um, so the, these are areas, and of course, um, we are trying to diversify into, we mentioned tourism already, but also defense mm. uh, cooperation. Uh, uh, Brazil has one of the largest military industrial uh, factories and one of the largest armies. Sometimes people are saying that it's number nine as the largest military and with the largest reserve of soldiers of 1,600,000 and the conscription is a uh, forced conscription in spite of the fact that Brazil is not uh, having any issues with any neighbors and always having very beautiful uh, peace treaties and peace accords with all its neighbors yet it has this strong army which I believe is very important for the integrity of the country and also for the saving from uh, what we call national uh, disasters or whatever that can happen such a happen in such a vast land right that is correct actually if you looked at at the armed forces in terms of active troops mm. Egypt has more. Yes, your your two hundred and fifty thousand yeah, or something. Three hundred and sixty thousand yes. is the number I have, and mm -hmm. Egypt would have four hundred and fifty thousand. Mm -hmm. uh, but we do have a defense industry, and Brazil has participated mm -hmm. in some of the fairs that are organized mm -hmm. here, the EDEX uh, mm -hmm. last year. One of the very few uh, countries who have uh, aircraft carriers as well. Well, <laughs> we 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 have. Um, developed, yes, air, aircraft industry, as we mentioned, mm -hmm. and uh, this is an important item in our bilateral agenda. I haven't mentioned yet the fact that our vice president visited Egypt mm -hmm. last September, mm -hmm. where he was received um, practically as a head of state. He met with President Sisi and uh, with Prime Minister Madbouli, but he also met uh, with the Minister of Defense, mm -hmm. our vice president being an army general mm -hmm. himself. Mm -hmm. So very knowledgeable about these issues and a number of areas for cooperation were looked into, including um, exchange of experience uh, on United Nations peacekeeping. You're the, one of the heaviest sharers in the UN uh, peacekeeping force all over the world, especially in, uh, in for example, in Easter Timor and places like that. You, you did your share in this. That's correct. We've been very active in places like Haiti, yes. uh, where we held the force commander position for several years and in the Democratic Republic of the Congo um, with UNIFIL in Lebanon, uh, the naval element, uh, East Timor, mm -hmm. as you've mentioned. So um, there are uh, special programs mm -hmm. for um, training Brazilian troops to serve with the United Nations. Mm -hmm. And this is where we would like to uh, receive um, officers from Egypt to to share in our experience mm. and maybe mm, exchange or uh, provide some insights and learn also from your own because mm. Egypt has been a very important uh, troop contributor uh, as well. Um, so mm. we also, uh, maybe I should mention, we have been elected to uh, a, a seat in the Security Council. Yes, for the 11th time this time. 11th time, yes. So this is a... Uh, something we're rather proud of because along with Japan, we are the um, country that has been elected most frequently mm -hmm. to the Security Council. Mm -hmm. And this allows us to accumulate also some knowledge and experience. In, Especially in the multilateralism and multilateral relations. In promotion of peace within the United Nations, yes. It's not um, an easy task because uh, the challenges are tremendous and um, we have been facing uh, many situations that um, 
uh, defy multilateral uh, mm. solutions. Uh, but we are strong, strong believer like Egypt in um, international law and uh, upholding the United Nations mm. Charter. And so um, this opportunity we have of serving again in the mm. Security Council is something that we are taking very seriously. And I, I might add that um, Brazil uh, has another common trait with Egypt, which is a strong investment in the diplomatic career. Mm -hmm. We have very similar um, institutional diplomatic cultures mm -hmm. uh, where uh, ambassadors, diplomats are all trained uh, as career uh, professionals. And the foreign minister is very often, if, with few exceptions, a career diplomat or which a, is, a career which ambassador. Which is very important, right? yes. Instead of being a political appointee. This has been the case in Egypt so. uh, consistently, and it has been the most common um, form of appointment in, in Brazil as well. Um, and I would add that, you know, Cairo is probably uh, the capital in Africa with the largest number of foreign embassies. Exactly. Um, around 140. And Brasilia is the capital in Latin America with the largest number of foreign embassies. Um, this is something we're rather proud of because Brasilia is only 60 years old. You know, it's, mm. a, it's a new city mm. and still um, it has become a major diplomatic uh, venue. So this investment in diplomacy, I think, brings us together and allows us to some degree speak the same language, even if we have to resort to a third language, which is neither Portuguese nor Arabic. But hopefully in the future, more Brazilian diplomats will be speaking Arabic and, and more and Egyptians and vice versa. I, I'm very happy that some of my colleagues here at the embassy have a very satisfactory level of Arabic, Arabic. better than the ambassador, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> well, sir, thank you very much for a beautiful interview. We really uh, love the brainstorming that you have, did, sir, have done, sir, today. And we, we really enjoyed the wealth of your information and your experience and definitely sharing with us your wisdom was a really great help for us and for our listeners to share. And before we leave, you have to promise us two things. The first thing is that you come back again, sir, to, to share more information. That is and, promised. And, and, to give, <laughs> and, to give us. and the second important point, I cannot leave this. I am not a big football player, or, but everybody would say, how come you have His Excellency the Ambassador of Brazil and he didn't talk about <laughs> Brazilian football. So this will be an, uh, an asset to add something about Brazil. Everybody in Egypt loves Brazilian football. Everybody knows about Santos. Everybody knows about Belé. But everybody enjoys and wait every four years to see what the Brazilians will do. So what will, will the Brazilians do this year, sir? Well, we're what are, very, what are, are your anticipations? We are very <laughs> happy uh, to, to be participating in the World Cup in an Arab country, in, yes. in Qatar. Uh, it will happen towards the end of the year. We regret that Egypt had, did not yes. qualify. Everybody um, regrets that. Uh, but um, we <laughs> hope that um, Egyptians, uh, if not in their entirety, but a, a large proportion, uh, will be supporting the Brazilian Definitely. team. Um, we have um, the most titles uh, of any country uh, yes. as a. Uh, We're world waiting for the Samba in football. Uh, yes, post. and who knows? Maybe this is our opportunity to get our sixth World Cup. Inshallah. We're, inshallah. We're looking forward, sir. <laughs> Today, in this beautiful afternoon in Cairo, and this beautiful weather today, we have shared the wealth of information of His Excellency Ambassador Antonio Patriota, who was very kind enough to come to our studio three. And my name is Dr. Amr Mabrouk. Dua Muhammad was at the control. Stay tuned to Radio Cairo and be with us next week. Thank you. <laughs>